you very much. Thank you all very much indeed. Happy publication day. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. This is the most wonderful book. I have been very lucky because I got a, uh, I, I got a, an advanced copy. Um, it's quite good. Uh, if you have got your copy on your knee, just have a look at the cover because that is an image and a half, isn't it? It's incredible. Tell yeah. me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad we got that as the, the photograph of the cover of the book. That's Bruce McCandless. Um, and it looks like it's photoshopped, but, but it's not. That's Bruce and he's about 300 meters away from the space shuttle, the Orbiter Challenger. And this is in 1984. And Bruce is completely untethered. So he's got a jet pack. It's, it's probably got about three hours worth of fuel, which is just nitrogen gas there. And he's flying this jet pack around. But that's the first time anybody has ever done a spacewalk without a single tether attaching them to, you know, their, the safety of their spacecraft. And from a test pilot's point of view, that just takes enormous courage. Uh, the level of risk and isolation and rem remoteness that Bruce would have been feeling there is, is unbelievable. Or just whippy. Well, yeah, <laughs> there was that. I think it was, it was quite funny because when they were even talking about the, 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 the jet pack, there was a bit of a discussion about why, uh, yeah. and they weren't really sure why, but it was just like, why not? Uh, it's kind of like the jet ski, uh, if you like. You go down to the beach, it's like, why not? Let's have a go. And I think they, they felt it, there could be some future use for a, a jet pack like that. And actually, we did end up having a future use because we, we now have a scaled down version of that that we all wear on every spacewalk. And it's much smaller, but it gives us about 20 seconds worth of fuel. And that's like a one shot chance of getting back to the space station if we fall off. So it was all thanks to, to Bruce. Wow. He actually spent 10 years developing that system because he was selected back in 1966. So he spent 18 years in total before he flew on his first mission to space. So, yeah, we've got a lot to thank Bruce for. The stories in this book are astonishing. And as I say, it is a celebration of the 628 people in human history who have left the Earth. And when I was reading it, I was thinking, what is it about human nature that compels us to want to go where maybe we even shouldn't or couldn't or <laughs> no one thinks is possible. What is it? I know it's, it's difficult to quantify, isn't it? That, that human, that innate desire to explore. It's what we've always done. We've always pushed the boundaries. We've explored across the oceans, through the forests, over the mountains, across deserts. And when we look up to the stars, I mean, I did as a, as a young boy, I looked up to the stars and just wondered about the big questions, you know, what's out there and how did we get here and is there other life out there? And, and that's the natural place to explore, another, another boundary to push. And that's certainly been the inspiration, I think, for all 628 people who've decided to you know, leave the surly bonds of Earth and, and explore space. But it, I mean, it's one thing, as you say, to look up at the moon, at the stars and go, I wonder what's out there, but then to actually put that into practice you know not only were people thinking let's maybe go to space let's explore it but then they had to work out well who would go yeah. and how how do you tell whether they're the right people when you know i mean this is it, it sort of takes pioneering to sky high levels yes yeah absolutely and of course in the beginning it wasn't a, a who it was it was a what yeah uh, in 1957 when this little beeping satellite flew over the united states and and they realized that the soviets had pipped them to the post and and if they're going to put sputnik into space this little satellite then then humans will follow soon and you're absolutely right it became well who's going to who's going to do this job uh, and I think it's fascinating, we, we forget, we use the word astronaut all the time, I certainly do in, in my line of work, and, and, you, and it's only when you stop and pause and think there, re there wasn't actually a word for it no. in, in 1957. They had to have a, a discussion in NASA, a meeting, what should we call these new people? And cosmonaut was actually the favoured term. And it made more sense really, you know, sailors across space, that's the Greek interpretation of cosmonaut. And astronaut is a star sailor which sounded a bit grand. 
we're not really sailing amongst the stars yet. You know, maybe in 100, 200, 300 years time, who knows? But the nearest star is 4.25 light years away. <laughs> so yeah. um, astronauts seemed a bit grand, but that was the, that was the term that, was that NASA went for and the Soviets went for cosmonaut. And because there was so much pressure to get people into space, there was this race. Yeah. Really, it was, it was down to efficiency that both sides, Soviets and US, decided to go for the easy option. And the easy option were, was, well, we've got rockets, this is test flying, we already have a pool of military fast jet test pilots, surely that's the kind of people that we want to go into space and be our early astronauts. And, and, it, and it, of course, instantly that, that narrowed down the pool massively. That's who they both went for, fast yeah. jet military test pilots. I mean, it sounds like an obvious question, really. Um, why a test pilot? Is it because, and you were one yourself, um, is it because you're spectacularly brave, uh, yes. a bit dim? <laughs> um, or, <laughs> what is it, what, what is it about the, 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 again, the sort of mentality and skills of a test pilot that NASA and the Soviets thought, well, those are the people that clearly should be going into mm. space? You missed willing to take disproportionate risk. Oh, there um, is that, yes. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that, that in, in some respects, it's that uh, the decisiveness, I think, it, the quality of a test pilot in terms of being able to think under pressure, work under pressure, um, and, and those initial flights, that was really important. Yeah. It was the analysis of this is a technical piece of equipment. Is it functioning normally? Um, what can I do about it? How can I fly it? How can I problem solve? That role has morphed over the years to be so much more. In the early days, it was about getting to space and getting back from space mm. safely. Mm. Now, in a six month mission to the ISS, the getting there and back is two days out of 186 days. So the, you know, the remaining time on your space station, that's when you're a scientist, you're an engineer, you're a plumber, an electrician, uh, pull a tooth if you need to, bit of CPR, uh, all these other things that we've loaded on top of the astronaut role. But back in the early 60s and late 50s, it was really focusing on those test pi piloting skills. So as you say, you know, there, there was a pool of test pilots uh, to draw on. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly of, of NASA now, because as you say, they were under pressure. The Soviets were winning the space race um, and America didn't want to be outdone. Um, they had this pool of test pilots, but clearly they had to narrow them down too, and they narrowed them down eventually to the group that became known as the Mercury 7. Mm. Um, but I mean, some of the tests that they were asked to do seem extraordinary now. I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to try it out on you. Um, oh, no. What do you see, <laughs> Tim Peake? I mean, this is a serious test, isn't it? This, yeah. They would be handed a piece of blank white paper and told, what do they see? A absolutely. And Pete Conrad, who I never got to meet, um, I would have loved to have met him because, you know, he, he just comes across as a really colourful character with a wicked sense of humour, but very professional. And he, he stared at this blank piece of paper for a long period of time and handed it back and said, well, it's upside down. Um, <laughs> which uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that was why he failed the selection or whether it was because he also presented his stool sample in a box with a pink ribbon on it. Um, and he left his full enema bag on the examiner's desk as well. But anyway, probably the three things combined, he, he, was, he was deemed unfit for space really? flight and he was uh, failed his selection and ended wow. up being the third person to walk on the moon because Al Shepard persuaded him to apply the, the following year. So clearly he wasn't so, unfit for so space So the flight. person who maybe who'd had the enema left on his desk had left. <laughs> I, left I think so, something. yeah. Um, Michael Collins as well, he came up with a rather um, <laughs> novel, uh, what he could see on his blank white sheet of paper. Yeah, he, he went for 19 polar bears fornicating in the snow. Yeah. 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 Um, that was, that was, I think, on an Air Force medical that he'd had the test before. So he knew the perils of messing about during this test. And so um, actually, so he really prepared Michael Collins for his selection. And he thought he'd nailed it. He thought he'd done everything right, um, abided by all the rules. The US Air Force had even sent some guidelines around about how you should perform because they, they wanted as many US Air Force pilots to become astronauts. But he, he got the rejection letter. 
And again, Michael Collins had to go for a second time round to get before he was selected. Was it because the length of his socks wasn't quite right? <laughs> was there yeah. something about where so someone said wear knee length socks and make sure if you're standing with your hands on your hips, your thumbs are pointing backwards That's right. rather than forwards? There was, there was a correct way to stand, a correct way to dress. Uh, if you're drinking cocktails in the evening, take a long drink and take your time. They didn't want people getting drunk and embarrassing themselves. Right. Uh, so all these kind of tips and hints as to how to socialise when you're going through your selection process. And of course, um, then once you are selected, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go to space. You've got to go through an enormous amount of training um, before you, know, you get anywhere near a rocket. Mm. Um, Doug Wheelock's uh, quote um, from, and he, he first went to space in 2007, is that right? Mm. Um, he said uh, that training for space flight is like trying to drink from a fire hose. Yes, yeah, uh, there's no other way of describing it really. Uh, and, and it's become, you know, every year we load more in, into the training program as there are more things we think of that astronauts can do. And it really is impossible to retain all of that information. So I think the, the, the key art when you're training to be an astronaut is just learning what you're allowed to forget and what you really mustn't forget. Uh, it's kind of compartmentalizing. And of course, the really important things to remember are the things that are going to save your life. It's the emergency training, um, things not to do like fall off on a spacewalk and uh, uh, press the wrong button in the rocket. So you really focus on the absolutely you know, paramount important things. And then everything else actually you can do if you just follow the procedure. I always say to, you know, if people are asking me, but you know, how do you remember all this stuff? So, well, if you can build an Ikea wardrobe, you can pretty much fulfill a day on the space station because that's all we're doing. We're following procedures uh, and fulfilling those jobs. But it's Wait. when there's a fire or something, it's all got to come from it's up here. It's all got to come. You had, I suppose, the advantage of, you know, several years, decades of, space flight that had already happened mm. you know the mercury 7 were training for something that no one really knew what they were training for or what or what they were going to come up against i mean there's all all sorts of factors which as i was reading the book kept you know occurring to me like nobody knew how the human body was going to be able to cope with no gravity mm. um you know nobody knew if there was a way, you know, what was going to happen when you broke through the Earth's atmosphere and, and, and went into orbit? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's actually more and more astonishing the more you start to think about it. It really anyone is, yeah. did it. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And of course, we look back with the luxury of hindsight. And there was a, a chapter I really enjoyed writing in there, which was known unknowns and yeah. unknown unknowns. And the known unknowns are perhaps the easier ones. If yeah. you know you don't know something, you can try and think about what you might do to mitigate that risk. Yeah. But the unknown unknowns, that's what's going to bite you. And the, the long list of what ifs, um, yeah. well, just before going into orbit, you know, what if the human body doesn't work properly? What if the heart stops beating? What if you can't swallow? What if you can't breathe properly? Um, and then when a few years later, they're looking at going onto the moon, what if the regolith is so deep that the lunar lander just sinks right the way down yeah. uh, and we can't lift back off again? Uh, or you jump off the ladder and disappear up to your waist and, and you're stuck. Uh, then these are real problems. Uh, would the static electricity generated by landing and all the electrical equipment, would that cause all the regolith just to stick to your suit and, and not be able to see? Would you fog up with your visor? Um, and at some point they just had to draw a line and say, we're going, we're just going to do this. Um, you know, yes, there are unknowns, but at some point you just have to say, let's go for it. Obviously Gagarin was the first man in space. Um, he orbited the Earth once. I, I, I found it extraordinary why he was picked because he wasn't the only Russian astronaut, cosmonaut. Mm. Um, again, they had a, a selection process. He'd done all the training, but there were several people kind of in the running to make that first flight. And it wasn't necessarily because he was the best, was it? No, I mean, they were all so talented. They'd gone through their selection process and their training process. And Kamenin, who was in charge of the Soviet program, had this difficult decision. Uh, it, he'd narrowed it down to German Titov and, and Yuri Gagarin. And 
he knew them both very well and their families while they were friends and he had to make this decision. On the one hand, he knew that he was going to be bestowing this incredible honor on, on this individual. You're going to be the first human in space. But also secretly, they gave themselves probably a 50-50 chance that they wouldn't be coming back. So yeah. he could be condemning one of his friends, you know, to a terrible fate. And uh, he had sleepless nights trying to figure out who was going to be first. And really it came down to the fact that, you know, German Titov, German is a bit of an unfortunate name when, you know, post-World War II, and German sounded a bit like German. And, uh, and also, you know, German Titov came from perhaps a bit more of a, a white collar background, whereas Yuri was just strong, solid Russian stock, blue collar background and a winning smile. And it came down to really likability. And uh, he thought, Yuri looks good, looks good in the photos. You're it. So even in those very, very early days of space flight, they were kind of thinking of it as a PR exercise, you know, that he and, and, and astronauts of the future were going to be the poster boys. Yes, but that, what was remarkable about that, you're absolutely right. On the one hand, they were thinking that far ahead and they were clearly looking forward to the publicity that would follow yeah. uh, and being able to tell the world they'd put the first human in space. But they forgot to actually put anything on him that showed that he was a Soviet cosmonaut. And he was on the way to the launch pad and somebody said, well, there is nothing. There is no patch, there is no symbol. So they got a can of red paint and painted CCCP on his helmet. And it was one of the engineers did that. And we know that because there are photographs of him fully suited, ready to go to the rocket without it. And then him climbing into the rocket with the CCP on there. And you just think, how could you make that P PR faux pas yeah. of, of not having anything? Um, and, and so subsequent to that, all the cosmonauts then had to have this red painted CCCP on their helmet because that's what they'd done with Yuri, uh, so it's quite remarkable. It is, it is amazing. I was thinking about, you know, again, this idea of, of who gets to be an astronaut. And as you say, you go through all this selection process, but, um, you know, could, could anyone consider, I suppose if you've been a test pilot, you know if you're, you're not travel sick or if you are travel sick, you've got over it. I mean, you know, mm. For us mere mortals who have to take, you know, a seasick pill if it gets a little bit choppy, does that mean we could never be an astronaut? No, it doesn't at all, really, because there isn't a huge amount of correlation between people who get motion sick on Earth and people who suffer from space sickness. Um, yeah, and, and it's something we're still researching. We don't quite know why. Some people handle space very well and don't get ill at all. And, and some people, even you know, fast jet test pilots who've got hours doing high G maneuvers yeah. will be sick for a couple of days on board the space station, um, even today. So we, there's, uh, when you go through the, the training uh, with the Russians in Star City, one of the things they get you to do in the days leading up to your launch is to go in the spinning chair and you have to s go in this spinning chair and Is then- Is it like that Michael McIntyre game show? <laughs> <laughs> like the wheel, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and you get spun around and you have to move your head up and down like this as you're being spun around. And it's horrible, it's dreadful. Everybody just feels absolutely sick as a pig for hours afterwards. And uh, Yuri Malenchenko was my Russian commander and he was on his sixth mission to space. And I noticed that he wasn't doing the training. And I said, you know, Yuri, is that just because you're just immune now? Yeah. You know, you've done it so much. And he said, no, there's just no point in doing it. He said, it will make everybody sick and it has no relation to what you're going to feel like up there. <laughs> so I thought, well, if you're not doing it, I'm not doing it then. So, <laughs> so I decided to, to go and have a cup of coffee instead and not do it that day. But, and it is right. I mean, I, I actually was very lucky going into space. I felt a little bit ill on the first day, but really not much. Right. So I, I got away with it going up into space, but I suffered coming back down. I had at least two days feeling really, really rough when I got back down. So nobody knows you know, what it's gonna feel like. Can you be an astronaut if you're scared of the dark? <laughs> it probably would help if you've kind of overcome that fear, right. I think. Okay. Um, you can, actually, it's, scared of the dark inside the space station is not a problem, but outside the space station, it gets dark really quickly. When you go from day to night, you'll be working away and you've had 45 minutes of daylight. And then suddenly 
it goes to nighttime in about a minute and a half. Wow. And um, if you've still got your gold visor down, you know, have to lift that up quickly, you can't see a thing, your helmet lights illuminate the area in front of you, and your whole, whole world shrinks to what was the universe, to a small pool of light just in front of you. And it's really easy to get lost because the space station's a big place, it's the size of a football pitch. Um, you know, it's gonna fit inside this cathedral. And if you're at one end, um, you, you don't really know where you are. And if you turn upside down without realizing, where, when you start heading right, uh, actually it should have been heading left. And, and you can get very easily disorientated. We've got little black arrows outside the space station pointing back to the airlock. <laughs> so if you lose your way, you find those black arrows and it, it takes you back to safety. I mean, it sounds a bit like um, for anyone out there who is a diver, diving in really bad visibility and, yes. you know, again, that sort of sense of you don't know whether you're upside down or back to front. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like that. Yeah. Um, and what about vertigo? Because, I mean, you look at something like that, you look mm. at that photograph and you go, I mean, you know, standing on, the, on a cliff edge can be scary enough. What's yeah. the sensation? I mean, you did this. You walked mm. in space, Tim. The, the funny thing is, when you're acting like an astronaut, you don't get that sense of vertigo. Um, and what I mean by that is if you're, um, you know, you're floating and you're moving upside down and you're in this, obviously, in a weightless environment, your brain is, it says, OK, I'm in space, I'm not going to fall. It's a long way down, but I'm not going to fall. As soon as you start acting as if you're on Earth, your brain suddenly says, uh, you know, grip tightly, um, you're going to fall. And what I mean by that is when I was coming back uh, to the airlock with this big component that we'd taken off one of the solar panels, and I had to take a shortcut along a pole, and that was going to take me back to the airlock. And I was halfway along this pole, and because I was moving along it, exactly as I would have moved along it if I'd been on Earth, and I was yeah. kind of hanging on in this direction with Earth beneath me, and I looked down, and my brain just said, you're hanging onto a pole, it's a long way down, you're going to fall. And I'd been out the door for about two hours at that point without a problem, and I suddenly got the biggest wave of vertigo, and I was just clinging onto this pole, and I just had to kind of calm myself down and wiggle my toes. Which... How, I mean, how far below you was so that's, Earth? That's 400 kilometers, and Australia's passing beneath you. And yeah. it's a, it was a moment. <laughs> Yes, I, I, should, should we just talk about um, some of the, uh, the issues, as you say, of, of, of kind of weightlessness? Because again, there were things that this book charmingly brought to mind while I was reading it. Um, I can't remember which crew it was, that all of them got head colds. Well, Apollo 7, they, had a, they had a rotten time. They had a rotten time. Yeah. And, and, and it just made me think, where does snot go? Yeah. <laughs> When there's no gravity. <laughs> yes. I mean, the one thing you really don't want to do inside your, your spacesuit is to sneeze. Um, and it sounds obvious, but if something gets on the front of your visor, it's there. There's no wiping it off. Um, and on a six hour spacewalk, that can be really annoying. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have to be a good crew member in space. You have to think about your personal hygiene and to not make a mess because uh, things in, in weightlessness are just going to carry on wherever they're going and nothing's going to stop it. OK, let's just get down to brass tacks, because I know secretly you're all thinking this, too. Um, gravity is quite important for things like just going to the loo. Yes. How does that work? I mean, can, can, does things get out or does everything just stay there? Um, so, OK, um, no, it does. When you have a pee, you have to pee into a tube and you have to put the fan on first and the airflow does the job that gravity normally oh, does for us down here. Okay. So the airflow keeps everything going into the container. Um, and the only difference is, whereas on the Apollo missions, for example, and on the shuttle, uh, that urine would just get ejected out into space and it would crystallize. And the astronauts would watch this beautiful firework display of crystallized urine going past the, the windows. Um, nowadays, we collect all that urine. It's precious to us because we recycle it all, about 90% of it. We recycle 90% of it back into drinking water in 24 hours. So that's, that's you know, keeps us uh, alive up there. Uh, and for number two, we don't recycle, thankfully, but um, <laughs> we, do, we do use uh, the airflow again just to keep everything going in the right direction there. But no, your, your bodily functions work perfectly normally. The one thing you don't do is you don't burp because there's no uh, convection. So get gas in your stomach doesn't, 
doesn't rise up. Uh, so nobody burps no burps. in space. No, there's no burping. Um, so um, uh, not really hiccuping either. I don't, I'd certainly not for me. Um, so no, the, so the, um, the gas comes out other ways. <laughs> Let's be mindful of where we are, shall we? Um, you talk a, a lot about, I mean, we'll go back to sort of Gagarin um, and, and Titov and, you know, he, him not being chosen. Mm. And, and you talk very eloquently, um, movingly actually, about this, what seems to be a fear that everyone who is selected to be an astronaut has, which is to be an unflown mm. astronaut. Just talk me through that. Yes, yeah, I called it kind of the, the ballad of the unflown astronaut. Just think of this, this lonely astronaut who's waiting for their mission that never comes. And that is a reality for every astronaut that's selected. You're not guaranteed a flight until you're sat on the rocket and until you're on your way. Um, and, and of course, there's this competition of, of when are you going to get the mission and people going ahead of you. Um, and in the early days, of course, there, there's not only is it, am I ever going to fly, but there's the prestige of, of what mission do mm. you really want? Mm. Uh, John Glenn was convinced he was going to be the first American in space. And there, it was a big shock to him when Al Shepard was picked as the first person. Um, Buzz Aldrin would have loved to have been the first person on the moon and, um, and really tried very hard to change people's minds so that he would be. And, course Neil was selected and German Titov I don't think ever lived down that that Yuri had gone ahead of him uh, as well so there are there are these sort of competitive elements but the one thing you don't want to be is an unflown astronaut and, and why would you be an unflown astronaut what, what is it just because you you just don't cut it perhaps you don't cut it um, perhaps uh, a medical problem comes along before you get your flight that happened to Deke Slate and he was mm. one of the Mercury 7 and he was going fabulously through all of his training, doing everything right. Um, and interestingly, I'll just throw in there, because with Deke, as he was selected, you talk about the, um, you know, the process. I hadn't realized that Deke, first of all, was missing the top of his ring finger, and he couldn't swim. And I thought, wow, that's amazing that he went through the selection process with those, yeah. those um, yeah. two things. But, but uh, on top of that, during his training process, they discovered that he had um, this atrial fibrillation. And so that was it. That was his astronaut career over. And he was then put in charge of the astronaut selection officer. He became the person who then chose the astronauts for the mission. Huh. Now, it turns out that Deke managed to get medical clearance later in life. And he did end up flying to space, but that was much further on down the line. But you had, I mean, you found out that basically out of your group, you were going to be the least likely to fly. Yes, yeah, I found that out because I, I went, to the, went to the printer one morning <laughs> to, to pick up something I printed out and the document that was underneath that I picked up inadvertently uh, said, you know, Timothy Peake from the UK is the reserve astronaut with the least, least chance to fly. And um, I guess on the one hand, that wasn't a huge surprise because I went into the process with my eyes open. Uh, the UK didn't pay in to the human spaceflight program. And I was surprised as everybody else was when I was selected in the first place. Jonathan Amos, the BBC science um, uh, uh, communicator, he, uh, officer, he was there and he asked the director general at the time, he said, why have you, why have you picked a British astronaut? We don't contribute. And Jean-Jacques Dordain said, well, you know, we're delighted to have Timothy performed extremely well during the selection process, so he's, he's on board. Um, but clearly ESA, the European Space Agency, had five flights and now six astronauts. So I was the one who was going to be the reserve astronaut waiting to fly. But in some respects, because our missions came down to politics and funding, it was about ministers and it was about you know, financial contribution to the program. It made it easier for us as a group. We knew that Luca and Samantha already had their missions. That yeah. was bought by the Italians. We knew Alex was going to fly because Germany paid the most into the program. Um, so we could work out the pecking order and it wasn't competition between us. But then speaking to my uh, friends in NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, they were all selected in the same year that, that we were in 2009. And they were in direct competition with each other because the, you know, they're, they're all from that one nation. Right. And so 
uh, it, it really was down to personality and, and performance. And I think in some respects, that's a much tougher environment to, to work in. So did you write to the British government and say, oh, go on, just pay up a bit more because I really want to go to space? <laughs> well, at the time, attitudes were changing anyway. Our space industry had been this hidden success story um, all through the uh, early 2000s and, and through the financial crisis. Actually, the one area that was growing at a double digit rate was the space industry. So attitudes were changing. We had gone from being the, the British National Space Centre. We didn't even have a space agency uh, when I joined to having our UK space agency in 2010 that was formed. So now we've got a space agency, we've got a booming space industry. And uh, it was the, that, that kind of changing attitude towards human spaceflight that we joined the programme in 2012 and I got assigned in 2013. How much does it cost? I mean, how much did the, how much did the UK government have to stamp up so that you did go to space? It's really difficult to know what it costs because no money changes hands in the ISS program. Hmm. So the European Space Agency, we get given flights by NASA for pieces of hardware we provide. So for example, we provide um, the uh, cargo vehicle. And if we provide four cargo vehicles a year to the space station and we give the NASA the cargo, yeah. in return for that, they'll give us two astronaut flights. And oh. the cargo vehicles are built in Germany and France and yeah. Italy. So that's going back into the economy, it's jobs. And, and so really there's, there's no cash changes hands between ESA or it's NASA, a sort of, it's, it's a, a complete a trading. barter. It's like if I give you my lollipop, you can yes, ride yeah. on the back of my bike. So unlike, you know, unlike space tourism, where a space tourist might go to a company and say, I'd like to fly to space, and they might say it's 25 million pounds mm. for a two week trip to the space station. That's not how it works at a government level. So the government invests in the space agency and then we get 90% of that money back in industrial contracts, whether it's rovers or satellites or, or whatever it is that that country happens to specialise in. And is there an enormous pressure on you, like, again, from some of the stories in the book, the kind of pressure on people who have been to space to then perform, to be, you know, the, the poster boys and women uh, later on um, for NASA or for ESA or for the various space agencies. Absolutely. And, you know, you are an ambassador for space. That's part of your role. But um, I think today we go into the job knowing that um, it, 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 when I was selected, we it still it was quite funny. Only Samantha had a social media account. She was on Twitter. And we thought, wow, you know, that's progressive. Uh, uh, we weren't, we weren't, uh, didn't, didn't have anything. And you think, you imagine now any of our astronauts selected last year not having a social media yeah. account, of course they all do. And, and, um, and so, but it just shows you even back then in, in 2008, which wasn't that long ago, um, you know, but, but even so we knew we would be ambassadors for space. We knew that we'd be doing PR was part of the role. That was, yeah. uh, that was what being, was being tested to a degree during our selection process. So um, it's a really important part of the job to be able to, to do that, to come back from your mission and to give back and to be the ambassadors. But looking back in the early days, of course, they had no idea. And again, fast jet test pilots, military test pilots, weren't necessarily the best communicators or the best ambassadors. I thought it was hilarious in the uh, press conference, the first, when they announced the Mercury 7, yes. and three of them are smoking cigarettes. <laughs> and they're just, you know, in the limelight with the cameras flashing. and. They had no idea, really, about the whole PR aspect of, well, of what to say. And also the sort of extraordinary thing of NASA just giving journalists their wives' addresses so that the yes. journalists could go and knock on the wives of the Mercury 7's doors and say, what do you think about your bloke going to space? Yes, I know. It was, it was quite remarkable, really. So it just shows you how far we've come in terms of public relations. You alluded earlier to, um, to the jobs that an astronaut does. And, and again, before I read the book, I, I confess, I, I now feel completely ignorant, but I just sort of thought an astronaut got into a rocket, not onto a rocket. I thought you got into it like, you know, like those Tintin yeah. <laughs> illustrations. And you went for a bit of a jolly. Yeah. Um, it's really hard. I mean, the flying is, is, is like, as you say, I mean, almost 
not part of what you do at all. You're having to be a, a, a scientist. You collect rubbish. You fix things. You, I mean, it, your days are packed. There's no time, it seems, to kind of look out the window and go, oh, look, there's a comet or yes. whatever you do. Yeah, and it's difficult to know that before you join up. I, when I was going through the selection process, I didn't really know what an astronaut did. Uh, and that's, I'd been working as a test pilot, so I was you know, reasonably familiar with the aviation and space industry, but I had never met an astronaut. I'd never had the opportunity to speak to them and, yeah. and, and to find out what their life was like and what you do. Um, and so it was only really as we uh, were selected, we started that training, you realize that, yes, you need to be able to fly a spacecraft and, and dock to the space station. Um, but that's just a really small part because now you've got to operate the robotic arm. You've got to capture visiting cargo vehicles. You've got to know how to do a spacewalk and operate all the scientific equipment on board the space station and fix it. And, um, and, and that you can't do everything. So we actually specialize in various modules. So for example, I was the specialist in the Japanese module, the European module, um, and Tim Copra, my friend, was a uh, NASA crewmate, was the US module he specialized in. And so you have to really dig down into the weeds and become a technical expert in those areas. So the training, it's as, as Doug, as we all said there, it's, yeah. it's drinking through a fire hose. There's so much to learn about. But what about, I mean, there's, there, there, you talk a bit, you don't go into huge detail about the scientific experiments, but I was kind of fascinated. Um, I was fascinated by um, Arabella and Anita, um, two spiders that were taken to space to find out whether spiders can spin webs in zero gravity, can they? Yes, they, they worked it out. So it was a bit messy to begin with, but um, no, like humans, they, they adjust and adapt to their environment. And I think that's incredible actually, because we can see ourselves adapting to that environment. We can yeah. measure things. We are taking blood samples, bone density scans, um, you know, muscle biopsies, uh, ultrasounds. And, and so we can see our bodies physically adapting to this environment when we go into space and when we come back down to Earth again. But to see other animals doing it equally as well is, is quite remarkable. Yeah, so lots of fruit flies have gone to space. Um, but there also seems to be a lot of, about growing things. Mm. Um, you know, plants being grown, types of wheat, uh, types of vegetables. Is that with a long-term view that people might actually live in space or that everyone is trying to be Matt Damon in the Mars movie <laughs> and grow potatoes. A mixture of both probably. Um, no, I think that you, some of the research that we do is looking forward in terms of space exploration. So going to the moon, we are going to need to be more self-sufficient than we are in low Earth orbit. Going to Mars, we're going to need to be completely self-sufficient, 100%. There's not going to be cargo vehicles following on every two months to supply the, the Mars mission. So growing food and understanding how we can be self-sufficient is important. But actually what's really important is the, the research that we're doing tells us a lot about how we can grow food more efficiently here on Earth. And all the research we do in space has Earth applications. Because um, it's quite funny, I was talking to somebody about how much you can stress a lettuce. Um, you can really stress a lettuce if you want to. I mean, they have an easy time. They're just having a holiday here on Earth. They get, you know, hours and hours of darkness. They don't need hours and hours of darkness. And if you get a lettuce in space, you can grow a massive one in two weeks. And it's beautiful and it's lush. And, you know, uh, and, and so we're learning about how you can grow things in arid areas, um, which you know, don't have huge amounts of water, that don't have nutrition-rich soil. Uh, what do they really need? A bit of potassium, a bit of phosphorus, um, some water there, and bingo, you've got food. And, and this is how we need to be thinking here on Earth about how we can grow food, sustain our population as the resources get fewer and fewer. So the more we can learn about these kind of things, the better. So actually, you know, what started out in a way as a kind of a competition, who can get to space first, um, scratching the itch, if you like, of, of humans want, wanting to explore further and further, has now got real practical value. It is informing us, it is teaching us, it is, it is perhaps allowing us to have a future. 
Yes, and I don't think we really saw back then in the, in the space race, I don't think they really envisaged where it was going. They knew that space was the high ground and, and you could do things in orbit, but we didn't know that you can actually print uh, human organs using bio ink in, in a microgravity environment. Because when you go into weightlessness, things that would normally collapse, if you try and make something of a, a, a small 3D structure here on Earth, it's going to collapse in on itself. Um, and so something like a protein crystal, which is really important for uh, drug manufacture, you, you, you take disease causing proteins and grow them and then the, the, the drug wraps around them. Um, you can grow them really well in space. You can um, 3D print uh, human organs, uh, a heart, um, and it will, it will, once you've got it into its fully formed structure, it's rigid and it's robust and you can bring it back down to earth. But you couldn't do that here on earth. It would just collapse in on itself. It wouldn't be a, a good heart at all. So this is the area we're doing research into. we would be manufacturing things in space and bringing them back down to earth. And that doesn't even touch on things like communication and navigation and climate uh, monitoring um, and potential for solar farms. Uh, don't get me started. So, <laughs> but, yeah, but, <laughs> but we, we, we had no idea, I think, back then as just how useful space was going to become to us. Because it is, I mean, you know, there, there could be a very uh, strong argument given where we are now with the state of our planet that should we, you know, be using enormous, enormous amounts of fossil fuels to put people up into space and um, potentially uh, damaging other planets when we haven't done a great job with our own. But mm. you've given a very compelling argument as to why perhaps we should keep going into space. Absolutely. I think space offers many solutions to many of the challenges that we've got here on Earth. I, I mentioned solar farms very briefly. I think that that can give us you know, clean, limitless energy from space. We've got our own nuclear fusion reaction up there. It's called the sun and it delivers so much energy to Earth. And uh, from space, of course, you can capture that on a massive scale and, and beam it down using microwaves. Um, so, but, but even to address the other point about the fossil fuels, I think, uh, and this isn't trying to defend the space industry, every industry can be cleaner, but the best rocket fuel is actually hydrogen and oxygen, which right. is a byproduct of water vapor, because that, that, that's the most powerful rocket fuel you can get. Um, now, we don't use hydrogen and oxygen all the time. Some rockets do, some rockets are using methane, some of the rockets are using kerosene. But by about two o'clock in the morning of any morning, the aviation industry has used up an entire year's worth of carbon output from the space industry. Um, so, uh, in fact, you know, by, by the time we've finished our discussion, the ABA, there's about seven to 8,000 aircraft flying over the planet at any one time. Um, so that's not to say that the space industry can't, couldn't be cleaner and couldn't be more efficient, but put it into perspective against aviation, against agriculture, for example, it's an absolute drop in the ocean. Um, and yet the bang for the buck is that we get to monitor our climate, we get to do research into pharmaceuticals, into new energy systems, battery technology, carbon dioxide removal systems, all these kind of things. So it is, it is a trade-off. I'm a firm believer of, of we need to get something back for every rocket launch. We should be getting you know, benefits back, yeah. scientific research. You talk uh, or you tell Neil Armstrong's story uh, of of landing on the moon, um, his his you know small step uh, for for man and all of yeah. that. And NASA had great ambition after Armstrong and Aldrin had finished that very successful mission. They had great ambition to then you know colonize the moon mm -hmm. and to send people off to Mars. And and their sort of time frame was roughly the 80s. Yeah. And yet here we are in 2023 um, and no one went back. Mm. Um, why? Why has there been this big gap? I mean, we'll, we'll get on to the fact that it's going to be filled shortly, but why did everything stop when it seemed like the space race really was racing? Yes, no, it's, it's a good question. And I know Gene Cernan, the last man on the moon. So uh, December 72, uh, I was eight months old when he left the surface of the moon and, and got that title. And mm. he never wanted it very long. 
And yeah. he would have been happy if he'd had that title for a year or two, and then somebody else would have been back. Uh, and he died uh, still holding on to that title. Um, and, you know, we haven't been back in over 50 years because I think first it was to do with cost. America was spending vast amounts of money, 4.9% of their GDP on the Apollo program. That's not sustainable. Um, and also the missions were going there and back uh, and, you know, three, four day stays on the moon uh, and then coming back to Earth. And you can't sustain that as well. It's far easier to build a lunar base, but the technology wasn't really there and the funding wasn't there for one, one nation alone, just the United States to, to do that. So they looked closer to home and everybody started thinking about space stations in low Earth orbit. Let's learn more about living and working in this environment. So we had Skylab, the Russians had uh, Salyut uh, and, um, and onto the Mir space station, the Apollo Soyuz era, onto the International Space Station and the shuttle missions. It was the, it was the era of low Earth orbit. But with each of these programs costing money, there's no more money left over to do anything else with it. Mm -hmm. And so the International Space Station uh, is using up most of NASA's human spaceflight budget. So it's very difficult to run a space station and run a lunar program at the same time. It's one or the other. And once you've built your space station that's going to last for 25 years, then that means that for 25 years you're not doing anything else because right. of the money you have to invest into it. So it's only really now as the space station starts to come towards retirement and we're handing that over to commercial companies that the national agencies can start using their limited resources now to pool it together and think about going back to the moon. So the latest mission is Artemis. Yes. Talk us through that. Yes, Artemis is really exciting. Artemis 1 launched last year, an uncrewed mission, uh, and was very successful. Four of my friends are now training for Artemis 2, which could launch as early as November next year, mm -hmm. likely to slip in all reality into 2025. Um, but that would be a bit like Apollo 8, going around the moon into orbit and coming back. But uh, a lot, uh, in many respects, is quite different because the orbit they're going into is a very challenging orbit. And they're also going to, it's a highly elliptical orbit. They'll be very far away from the moon at the furthest point very close to the moon surface, surface at the nearest point. And um, it's changing the plane by 90 degrees because in the Apollo era, you know, landing on that thing, you kind of launch around the equator of Earth and that takes you kind of around the equator of the moon. So right. all of the six landing sites in the 1960s and 70s around the kind of the equatorial band of the moon. We want to go to the South Pole of the moon because the South Pole there's water ice, and that's really interesting. That's where the laboratory will be, and, uh, and there's permanent sunshine there for energy. So you need to change that orbit from an equatorial to a polar orbit. Right. That takes a lot of mechanics and mathematics and fuel and working it all out. So it's a, it's a much more complicated mission than it was in the Apollo era. So Artemis II will be trying all of that out. So and it isn't just repeating what was done 50 years ago. It is, it is moon exploration yes. with knobs on. Yeah, with knobs on, absolutely. Because we're going to build a space station orbiting them in that this funny orbit I've talked about. It's called a near rectilinear halo orbit, NRHO. But it, they're, they're going to build a space station in that orbit and that will facilitate the lunar base that will eventually be built as well. So space station in the moon's orbit, lunar base at the South Pole, and crews going to spend six months to a year on the lunar space station. Now, my, my final question was going to be, um, why did you only fly once? And do you wish you were part of Artemis? <laughs> but then the headlines came out yesterday. <laughs> What's going on, Tim Peake? What's going on? So. Uh, there's a company called Axiom Space that many people won't know about uh, because they're not, it's not Elon Musk, it's not SpaceX, it's not Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin. Uh, they're a, a smaller company and a, a less known company, but they're actually building the next space station. So hmm. a lot of people will get to know about this company in the future. Um, and those modules are being built at the, the, at the moment. They're going to bolt on to the International Space Station. So when it retires, Axiom Space Station will be left there. So Axiom are a commercial company that are running commercial space flights. And they've got an agreement with the UK Space Agency to look at an all UK astronaut mission. 
which is really exciting. It's early days. Has that never happened before? Um, no, it's never happened for the UK and never for a single nation on this kind of commercial basis. I mean, we've had an all Russian flight, we've had an all American flight, an all Chinese flight, but we certainly haven't had an all UK flight and not something that's commercially sponsored. So at no cost to the UK taxpayer. Hmm. Um, this is a really interesting model that we're exploring and investigating. So, and how are they getting their money? So, is this is this space tourism? Are you going to basically be like a, a, a pilot for EasyJet, only <laughs> flying a bit higher? <laughs> Not space tourism, because it's going to be you know uh, all professional crew doing scientific research and education and outreach. So, it's nobody is paying for their ticket. It's right. not space tourism uh, in that respect. And the commercial companies you kind of mentioned about well, how do they get their return on the investment. Well, the return for them is scientific payloads, maybe right. on the mission itself, or maybe on a future Axiom space station. Um, and so it'll be companies that are interested in microgravity research and, and that kind of long-term investment into space. Um, so it's a really interesting model and early days, no crew selection yet, but I am um, working with UK Space Agency and Axiom and trying to make the mission happen. At the risk of sounding ageist, <laughs> Are you allowed to be an astronaut when you're 51? So when I flew, I was 43 and Tim Copra, my NASA crewmate, was 53. Oh. Uh, Yuri was a little bit older than that. So we, we all fly astronauts up to 60 years old for a long duration mission. Yes, um, there's still time. Yeah, so six, 60 is the current kind of cutoff. Okay. Um, so there is, there is still time. Um, yeah. But it's, it's interesting in spaceflight, actually, age can sometimes be, uh, be a benefit in terms of, you know, the experience that you have. And, and obviously the great advantage if you're a middle-aged woman is being in a no-gravity situation. Absolutely. Isn't it, girls? <laughs> um, Tim Peake, you're a wonder. Thank you very, very much. Indeed. Thank you so much, Kate. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.